This is Nursing 622, Module 9, where we talk about infertility, menstrual, pelvic syndromes, antepartum. Your learning objectives to identify the menstrual, pelvic, and fertility disorders across the lifespan. This includes adolescence. Diagnostic modalities that are common, treatment plans, and then preconception care for women. So we'll start with the young women's health, especially adolescents, those age 10 to 19. Remember, you're supposed to be checking pregnancy tests even in adolescence. As of right now, at the age of 11, there is when we start, or if the age of menarche is later. Remember, menarche is when they first get their periods. This comprises, you know, a good amount of your visits, a lot of your anticipatory guidance, there is quite a few health objectives in Healthy People 2020, which again looks at those health disparities. We look at those indicators for adolescent health, death rate, birth rate, high school students, if they're graduating, if they abuse alcohol or drugs, those working, not working, attending school. You look to identify those health problems, those risk-taking behaviors. If they're not doing well, this is why it's important in primary care to ask, how are your grades? How are you doing in school? Has there been any unintended injuries, violence, bullying? We've been seeing a large amount of bullying going on lately. How are they reacting to that? How are they handling that mentally? Alcohol, drug use, sexual behaviors. Sometimes you have to have a visit without the parent in the room. And I ask the parents, can I speak to the patient by themselves? You're gonna get a little bit more information without the parent there unhealthy eating patterns, physical inactivity, a lot of gaming, especially with COVID recently and quarantine. We need to get up and get moving. <clears throat> you look at those protective factors. Do they have friends? Do they have family, social groups, that good support system, youth participation in the community? Normal for adolescents, you do have some withdrawal from family members, less interest, they want to be independent, the mood swings because of the hormone change, you know, their friends are more important than anybody else. They have a lot of body image disturbances. They're very insecure. Those sexual feelings start to come out with those hormones. They want to focus on themselves. They want to be accepted by their peers, sports, clubs. Encourage them to be active. Encourage them to talk about this with their parents. And then in late adolescence, this is as they're going to transition into their adulthood. Factors that influence this, of course, we have disability. Obesity is a chronic condition, and this has a significant effect on development for adolescents. High risk for abuse of alcohol, drugs, suicide, depression, bullying. These are all very important things that we need to address. Chronic conditions, we're seeing diabetes, worsening asthma, we're seeing high cholesterol, hypertension in this population. It's very important to keep up with those follow through, monitoring their vital signs, monitoring their lab work and encouraging them to talk to you. Looking at the immigrant and refugee population, if they have health insurance, language barrier, are they eating? Looking at sexual orientation, that identity like we've talked to in the past, about transgender and asking those hard questions. How do you feel about yourself? Have you had any thoughts of hurting yourself? These are all very important. Social context, uh, for the most part, parents have a good relationship with their children. There may be some difficulty with how the parents interact with the children. Of course, there's a benefit with two parents in homes that are divorced or if there has been a trauma in the family and there's only one parent, this is very important to make sure you discuss with the patient, how are you doing? How do you feel your support system is? And how do their parents react with their peers? Do they know where their kids are going? Do they know what they're watching on TV, what they're listening to, what they're playing on their phones with? There's a bunch of health services for adolescents. Um, counseling is very difficult, especially mental health. We struggle with that. There is a very large disparity for minorities and a lack of quality care for them as well. Adolescent women, they have that right to visit without the parents present. 
If it has to do with sexually transmitted diseases or pregnancy, no, you do not need the parent's consent. You need to build that trust. They need to know that they can talk to you because if there is something going on and they can't talk to their parents, you are that other resource for them. Look at their health history, any uterine bleeding, PCOS, the polycystic ovarian syndrome, dysmenorrhea, are they sexually active? Has there been a teen pregnancy? Is there a family history of any issues that we need to address? Looking at nutrition, eating disorders, substance abuse, again, mental health and all of these come full circle and are very important to address with the patients. Lab screenings, your basic vital signs, your BMI, looking at their height and weight on the chart, especially if they're on medications for like ADHD that could have some growth impairment. You need to make sure you're monitoring that. Are they getting their teeth checked? Are they having visual tests? Have you talked to them about sexually transmitted diseases? Are they up to date on their immunizations? Pelvic exams. We don't do pelvic exams on adolescents unless they are sexually active and there is a concern that there needs to be STD treatment and that varies and is very uncommon to be doing pelvic exams on adolescents. Again, if it's warranted and needs to be done on the late adolescents as they're going into adulthood, definite education about the procedure and just letting them see things before that actual visit that they're going to have to come in and have the pelvic exam done. Fertility and self-management. This is very important. Contraceptive use. A lot of parents are resistant to contraception for whatever reason that it is going to be prescribed, whether they're having dysmenorrhea and heavy periods and we're trying to make their menses much more tolerable, whether it's for sexual activity and we want to prevent pregnancy. We have to look at those pros and cons. We have to look at the family dynamics. But again, if an adolescent girl wants to start on contraception, you do not need the permission from the parents. There is a lot of community-based centers and family planning agencies that can help follow through with this and give them support as well. Consideration, benefits and risks, you know, anything with any medication that you look at, cost, health insurance. For the older population who are trying to get pregnant, there's natural methods that you can do um, if they don't want to be on birth control, but they're thinking about family planning, not ready yet. You can talk about basal body temperature to help prevent pregnancy until you're ready because some don't want to wait for that extended time to come off birth control, want to try to manage the contraception themselves. And that way they have a lot shorter time to wait if they do plan on getting pregnant. Combined oral contraception, uh, estrogen, progesterone, contraindications. You know, there's a lot that goes into this. You need to look at blood pressure, history of blood clots. Again, with any medication, checking for those contraindications. Other benefits of these contraceptions are acne. I Like I had said, uh, dysmenorrhea and with heavy periods, it helps. And less premenstrual syndrome and uh, cancer risk has been shown. When you start, you can start with the conventional. You, a lot of primary care physicians start with the low contraception. Why? Because we want to use the lowest medication possible to achieve the desired result, correct? If they have breakthrough bleeding, if it's not being as effective, then we can always titrate. And again, if it gets to a point that you're not understanding how much more you can do, know what you don't know and refer them out. Adverse effects, you discuss these with the patients, make sure that they are aware of what could possibly happen, what the side effects could be, how to prevent some of them by taking it with food the same time every day. Other types of contraception, you have the patches and rings, the progesterone only pills, and then you have your emergency contraception. You have your plan B that you can use. It's recommended within 48 hours. We also have IUDs. You have the copper T that is good for 10 years. You have the Mirena that has hormone base in it that is good for five. Barrier methods, we talk about male condoms, female condoms, diaphragms, whatever the choice is, as long as they're using some contraception and understanding that birth control pills is not STD prevention. That is the key here. You need both. 
Then there's Depo. A lot of people opt for Depo because it's one shot every three months. However, sometimes it's not as effective if the BMI is fairly high, um, can be started at any point. There are some side effects. Some people talk about weight gain. So understanding that long acting and those side effects are important. If you have someone who's already battling obesity and things, you might want to look at another route. There's the implant, implants, the Nexaplan that can be inserted in the arm. You can have some adverse effects. You need to talk to them about monitoring, about the removal of it, return to fertility, you know, liver disease, abnormal bleeding, blood clots. These are all things you need to discuss prior to when you make that appointment for them to have this implanted. IUDs, uh, talked about the Mirena's T-shaped flexible plastic. It's got the hormones in it. You have the copper IUDs that are non-hormone based that are good for 10 years. Again, understanding that there is a higher incidence for PID with this, the pelvic inflammatory disease. So if you have a patient who's had recurrent STDs and pelvic infections, I'd be less apt to give them an IUD because we now have introduced a foreign body into the uterus and they're at a higher incidence and risk for that pelvic inflammatory disease. And then of course there's sterilization with tubal ligation for women, vasectomy for men, and a hysterectomy, of course, in women would also be a form of sterilization. We'll go right to HPV. This is why we do our pap smears and screening. Remember that it is the most commonly sexually transmitted disease. Um, we monitor for it with these pap smears. These are our screening program. We need to make sure we follow up if we have abnormals. There's low risk, there's high risk. And again, if you don't know where to go with an abnormal pap smear that is positive for HPV, you talk to OBGYN. This is what they do. And if you can't get a hold of somebody and you need to refer out, you refer out. If you have an abnormal pap smear, know what you don't know. If you don't know what to do, there's no colleagues that you're not really getting a good answer from, then you refer out. Again, when you look at the statistics, we look at the disparities of health. Underserved populations have greater than 60% of these cases. Most are asymptomatic. Some can have bleeding with intercourse, but they might say, you know what, sometimes I spot a little, or it was a little bit rougher, or we had a different position and that could be it. And they might not think anything of it. This is why cervical cancer screenings are so important. Identify those abnormalities high-grade cervical cancer precursors and refer them out if you continue to have abnormals and you don't know where to go with your management. Looking at the cervical cytology, the pap smear, making sure that you're doing your pap smear, you're not using surgical lubrication because remember that can not give you enough of those cervical cells, right? We look for STDs as well. And if you need to do STD testing, you're going to get your cultures while you're in doing that pelvic exam. Treatment and management. If there's genital warts, you have the ablative therapy or excisional therapy. Again, this is usually an OBGYN referral. We also look at the HPV vaccinations, the Gardasil routine, age 11 to 12. Males are also expected to have this vaccination. There's a lot of controversial, controversial information out there about it. It is still, however, recommended. And having that discussion with the parents, as long as they know the risks and benefits and why we're doing it, they can make an informed decision. Remember that HPV doesn't have to just be vaginal. It doesn't just have to be penile in men. It can be anal. So we need to understand that there's other routes for these STDs. And if we're finding anal HPV, then we are concerned with HIV. We're concerned about other STIs. And therefore, that education needs to happen in further screening. Anal cytology, histology. Again, if this needs to go further besides you having an abnormal finding or a culture come back, we refer them out. Digital anal rectal exams, the DARE are encouraged. Number one, when you're doing your prostate exams, again, to see if there is any fissures in 
if there's any hemorrhoids, if they're complaining of that. But again, if you are unsure, you have colleagues or you refer them out. Just a little triage chart that you have in your shell, but also remember how I've said, you go through and do these screenings, you're looking at all these things, and what does it say towards the end there? Colorectal consult. We've gone through all these treatment plans, we've looked at different things, I've done the screening I'm supposed to, and I'm still finding abnormalities and I'm concerned. What do I do? I refer them out. Unintended pregnancies, and we see this a lot, especially in the adolescents. Um, you know, sometimes the adolescent will come by themselves, and it could be an older adult. You could have a 12-year-old being pregnant and a 40-year-old being pregnant, and they're both unintended pregnancies. Looking at the social dynamics, understanding the outcomes and implications of either A, carrying on the pregnancy, or B, not carrying on the pregnancy. So when we have these patients come in, we have the pregnancy testing that can be done, we have pregnancy options counseling, but we also have to have abortion counseling. Even if you are not in approval of abortion, it is your job to give that patient every option that is available. If you have to refer them out for abortion counseling, pregnancy options like Planned Parenthoods, that is fine, but it is your role to at least start having that dialogue with these patients for these unintended pregnancies. We also need to screen for intimate partner violence, as well as reproductive coercion. Is there a developmental dis delay? Are you wondering, okay, why is this happening when I don't think they fully understand even what sex is? These are all things that you need to look at when you're interviewing and taking a health history on the patient. Pregnancy tests, pelvic exams, and then of course ultimately ultrasound. And with a positive pregnancy test, you know, OBGYN referral is then warranted. Delivering pregnancy test results, it's helpful to know ahead of time if this is something wanted or not wanted. We're talking about uh, unintended. So therefore, you discuss with them if it's a urine test, possible false negatives or false positives, contraception options. If it's a blood test, we know pretty much, unless it has not been long enough since her missed period, a, a blood test is pretty accurate. And then we need to look at gestational age. Where are we in this pregnancy? Are they coming to us and they're six months pregnant or did they just miss their period? Knowing about pregnancy option counseling, what if they find out that they're pregnant and they're almost in their third trimester? What do you worry about with these patients who cannot terminate the pregnancy, however, do not want the pregnancy? Assist them with decision making. Tell them about options. Tell them about adoption. There's multiple things that you can give these patients for outreach programs and education to help them identify some support system and help them with their decision making. Early abortion counseling, like I talked about, making sure that you discuss this with them and you give them their referral and support their decision making, whether you agree with it personally or not. Later abortions um, can happen either spontaneously or it can happen intentionally right now we're talking about abortion that is selected by the patient so with this you have a uh, dilation evacuation most common method after the first trimester by labor induction that can happen and remember that there are different laws in different states and different facilities depending on the gestational age. Post-abortion care, usually follow-up at post-abortion care is either with the OBGYN who performed it or the facility. However, it might fall back on you as the primary care. So you need to make sure that there is some follow-up care within those few weeks after the abortion, not only for the psychosocial aspect, but for the physical aspect and medical seeing if they're having bleeding, are they having any infection, do they have any STIs, 
Have they had sex since they had the abortion? Is there still retained fetal parts from the abortion? Are they having pain? These are all things that need to be monitored and looked at and then further contraceptive counseling. Considerations for these special populations is, you know, consent laws for adolescents. We know, like I talked about before, they don't need parents' permission for this. We look at immigrant women who may not have that support system based on their ethnic background. We also look at women with mental disabilities, looking at those ethical guidelines, those legal safeguards, where do we draw the line ethically? And then you may need to refer out to psychiatry or therapy. They might have a hard time dealing with the abortion. A lot of times after the fact, they have regret, they have guilt, they have remorse, and we need to be there and be supportive for them. And then lastly, infertility, we look at, this is the inability to achieve a pregnancy after regular unprotected, well-timed intercourse. Remember, age plays a role in this, 12 months or more if you're under 35, six months or more over 35. Primary is if they've never been pregnant. Secondary is if they've had prior pregnancies. Fecundability is just that term that states the likelihood of when they would get pregnant in one cycle. You start to decline with your fertility at the age of 35. Risk factors for infertility, smoking, alcohol, overweight or significantly underweight. If they're very avid in sports, intensely exercising over the age of 35. History of chronic STDs, pelvic inflammatory disease, PCOS comes into play here as well. Um, you know, these are all factors, epididymitis for men. And then is there any exposures that have happened? Toxic substance hazards, chemo radiation. You know, some women unfortunately become infertile because they had cancer at a young age. These are all education and counseling discussions that we need to have and look at those other options. You look at the female history. You also look at the male history. Look at their physical BMI, sexual development, pelvic exams, what their history with STDs, how their menses are. We also know that in 30% of the cases, it's idiopathic, it's unexplained. Recommendations for these ethical issues, um, you know, we want to try to be as conservative as possible and then move to the invasive measures. You have to look at treatment costs. You have to have that discussion with the patient risks and benefits with that full disclosure so they know what these possible success rates are. Yes, are we going to refer them out to a fertility specialist? Yes, but they may only trust you and only want to talk to you initially. So having those resources available, you don't have to know them right in your head, but having those resources and being able to review them with the patient. Cancer survivors, fertility, preservation, reproduction. Some women will freeze their eggs, men will freeze their sperm if they're undergoing cancer treatments prior to starting it. So we have those cryopreservation. preservation. We look at the risk of congenital abnormalities. We talked about genotypes and see what the genetic factors are. Looking at patients with HIV, it used to be that you couldn't safely have a child having H HIV and now you can. Now there is still a possible exposure. However, we have the antiretrovirals. They do almost like a bloodless C-section to help limit that crossing of blood. So there's a lot more options out there. Adoption and then lesbian women. We need to make sure that we don't have that stigma. Again, regardless of your personal feelings, you need to have those resources for all of these special population types. Again, your textbook readings and resources.